Welcome to the Creative and Account Podcast. This podcast was created to educate people about the world of advertising and branded content from the unique lens of two professionals working on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm Frank DeLaRoyo, CEO and Creative Director at Straight Shot Post, a full service post production company that focuses on branded content. My co host, Melissa Reisman, is an account director at BBDO, one of the largest and most well respected agencies in the world. We hope to help you navigate through the challenges you'll face daily as you develop your career or business in this dynamic and quickly evolving field. I look back and I'm not surprised at the things that I did <laughs> because I know who I am, but I never got this kind of, I never had this type of conversation. Had somebody said, this works, if, if this is what you want to do, I probably, I probably would have just done it but I didn't know what worked for what I wanted to do. And at the time there wasn't a lot of education saying you need to be, here's the most important thing, guys. You need to basically, you need to be able to make other people money. You need to bring value to other people. I say money cause that's the easiest thing. But like if you provide more value to them than they're providing to you, you will be fine. And, but nobody needs a director or a writer cause everybody wants to do that. So therefore there's no way for you to give them value without, a substantial amount of experience to prove that it's worth it because there are just simply so many people doing it. But being an assistant or picking a craft, I think if you're coming out of a school like NYU or USC, um, that you recognize how powerful it is to have a craft and a tool, a, any sort of storytelling craft that could bring value. If you're a writer or a director, those things that are on the top of the above the line creative roles. I'm, I mean, very briefly, Melissa, tell me like how I'm sure you could just give us a sense of like how intense or how talented the creative teams are. You like you're you, I'm talking about the creative director of Duncan, for example. Mm -hmm. Who is it? And, and do you think they're a superstar? Yeah, I mean, um, of course, they're amazing and they are a superstar, but that doesn't also say that everyone else at BBDO is also the same. Um, I would say that they, it's not only, and I think you're asking about the creative directors who work on Duncan, right? Yeah. Or just, but I'm saying for people that are, that are trying to understand, see in her world, there's a hierarchy. Yeah. So if you wanted to be specifically a creative director, you would start as what an a, a copy community management. So if, if you were to start in, to be a creative, you would start at like a, an assistant art director, an assistant um, copywriter, and you would have to like work your way up. Right. Now, if you wanted to be a freelancer and just work in film and commercials, you don't have that trajectory, right? You don't have the infrastructure of a company that's going to support you and teach you and train you in the skills that you need. You have to f develop them on your own and get mentors and get a network that will eventually trust you to do those things. But a lot of people come out thinking that the network and the education they got at NYU was, or, or USC or whatever other art school was like enough to prove that they're an expert in that thing. But it's just not the case. There are people, essentially they're just people so much better than you doing that exact same thing. Um, and when you're talking about uh, high level execution, like there's no way you have to recognize there's, you have to be thinking about it this way. Why would Dunkin' Donuts hire you over someone who has literally done 50 to 100 plus Dunkin' Donuts ads exactly the way that they like them done, right? That's what you're competing with. And every single video has that level of competition. Why? Because it's freaking awesome. It's super cool what we do, okay? There's a lot less competition in other fields, you know what I mean? Um, so that's just something to think about. So I did nothing and then I went home and I stayed, I stuck, I had my head stuck in the sand and I slowly got a job here or there and I just stuck with it. Um, and I will say the only, the, the sort of, I, I learned to become a doer, but I would say outside of being a doer, which I do think is by far the biggest trait you, you would want to have. Um, I always say get good and then make yourself known. But you you were able to do both. I didn't make myself known, but I got really good. Mm -hmm. And so the few jobs that I did do were executed at such a high level that those people did not forget it. 
Now, the network didn't grow or expand nearly as quickly as it could have, but my career did sort of flip because of a phone call from a random person from a referral. Okay, and so doing good work and treating every single job as if it's your last, bringing your A game to D work, um, which is advice I got in my first job, um, that's actually going to be what people remember. Uh, you know, I always say to people like, Hey, look, like work hard, be nice. If you don't suck and you're uh, pleasant to be around, you're going to be fine. And if the more specific a job, the better, like it's way easier to be a colorist than it is to be an editor. Yeah. Right. Because a colorist, people know exactly what they want from you. But if you're an editor, those jobs vary. Hey, do you know any After Effects work? Can you also sound design? How is your experience with documentary versus comedy? Right? But when it's color, it's pretty easy. Oh, you color the video. I see what it looks like. If it looks good, it's easy. Does that make sense? So it's like if you're more targeted, but we talked about that when you were like, I knew once I knew I wanted to do account management, I knew I wanted to do advertising. You started broad, right? Mm -hmm. Then you started tasting within advertising. You started ruling things out. Oh, I don't like this. I don't like this. Eventually you landed on boom. This is the bullseye account management. And it just made everything a lot easier, right? Definitely. Because you could eliminate the rest now. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And for me, I didn't like, we could just skip the college years because college was great, but it wasn't, it was huge for me to learn the skills that would eventually become important, but it did not lead towards the work that I would be doing. Um, because like I said, what they, they don't prepare you well, in my opinion, for the workforce itself. Yeah. Yeah. But everything was learned afterwards through work, hard work. And the target in the beginning was broad. And then it became very specific when I realized, um, that I didn't need to be on set, which I think is a huge thing for you guys out there that like film, like figure out if you want to be on set or not. Some people love that they love the camaraderie there's a lot of weird shit that happens on sets like you get into a bubble it's like you're literally like it's very much it's a lot we talk a lot about like military stuff like you're you're in a typically in like very high stress environment and so you're all working together towards a common goal it builds these incredible bonds very quickly and then you get this very weird especially in a movie and then you get this like postpartum syndrome when the movie's over and you don't see anybody again it's so odd um, but people that like that and thrive off of other people in that kind of environment do. Since we talked about me in my past, you can see I was always somebody that didn't care about the peer pressure. Or like that was never a driving force. I was cool being alone. Being on set was fun, but it didn't feel like as an AD anyways, it didn't feel like I was getting better at story. And story was the thing I knew I wanted to be close to. So when I switched to becoming to an editor, like just focusing again on that target, things started to move a little bit quicker because I wasn't, um, you know, all the resources were going towards one thing. Um, and I had become known for being the story editor. So when I just imagine when I moved into your world, mm -hmm. I was smashing through these 15 second ads, 30 second ads, because I was so used to independent film, which was incredibly difficult and the decision making and the decision trees of what you could choose in a scene. Well, how do I want her to react this way or that way? What is her character feeling in the context of this two hour movie? You know, where is she in the story? All these things, when you're doing a 60 second ad, a lot of the decisions like that are, I don't want to say they're made for you, but there's a lot less to make. How does she feel about her Dunkin' coffee? Does she love it or does she really love it? That's it, right? It's not like you don't have that many options, you know? So it makes it so much, it was so much easier and I was very, very, very fast. And I think that's what allowed me to excel. But again, in a much longer uh, timeline, I ended up kind of doing what Melissa did, what, which was taste all the different things that were happening. And mind you guys, for context, I came out of NYU at 2010, okay? F Facebook was what, 2000 and eight or six when it launched yeah. YouTube came out, I think right around that time in 08. Um, the five D Mark II, which revolutionized digital cinema came out when I was in school. 
Yeah, you guys, is, you following me here, Melissa? Like things didn't exist. I didn't have. You're old. There I There was it. none of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Think. I get it. I mean, honestly, how much content do you make for YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok now? A lot. Like. Okay. So that, yeah, a lot. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. I yeah. didn't know that was going to happen, obviously, because it wasn't around. And so I thought I was going to do feature films. Um, and basically, when I hit 30, sort of had this awakening, like, why did I get into this in the beginning? It was to impact people. And guess what? Where are people's eyeballs now? I mean, how many Instagram and TikTok videos and YouTube videos have you seen versus how many movies have you watched in the past year? Yeah. Okay. And that's kind of what happened. Well, that's so also because of the <clears throat> pandemic. But yeah. I would say there's like, no, but a you could be watching front. movies on your couch. How many movies yeah. have you seen on your couch? A lot. Yeah. Okay. And how many compared to how many TV shows? The hard thing for me there is I don't actually have TV. I, I don't have like a TV provider. I just have like Netflix, Hulu. So I can yeah, watch, like I, I differ between like going from one to another, but yeah, but I are see you, your point. But that's no, but I count that. I'm just saying like Queens Gambit. Are you counting that as one of the movies you sat down and watched? No, it's a TV show. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. Or like, yeah. and then, if, so you, you, let's say, even if you're like, you, dude, even if it's like your entire thing and you're watching two movies a day, which no one's doing. I did that yesterday. Don't judge me. <laughs> let's Wait, not so go did there. I on Christmas, man. I watched The Dark Knight and Jingle All the Way and Soul and Mulan. And it was a freaking great day, oh, and I yesterday? hadn't done that in a long time. No, oh, this my... was on Christmas Day. Oh, it's like that is like a weird range of movies. I've been <laughs> watching with my husband like the DC movies in order because uh -huh. we watched all the, the um, Avengers movies in order. So now we're moving to DC. So we just watched yesterday Justice League, as I mentioned earlier, and then before that we watched, I believe, Wonder Woman. We're going in the order of like mm, how you're supposed yeah. to watch them so we're we watch sometimes like both of them in one day but yeah like no judge right. like for anyone that watches like binges a tv show or a movie i, mean, in a I day. wish i could <laughs> i wish i could all i'm saying is that most people's eyeballs are on their phone that's all so you have yes. to wake up or listening to a podcast like this so mm -hmm. i think kids coming out now that are interested in creative fields you have a tremendous amount of opportunity to decide what you're going to be making that people are going to be watching. And I think I want a lot of these young filmmakers to recognize that there's a ton of opportunity. If the goal is to impact people with your stories, there are so many places you can do that now. Obviously we're doing it this way, right? Via audio and some basic video on YouTube. Like there's so, so many ways and don't limit yourself. And when I was coming out, I was not, it took me a long time to accept that YouTube was um, as powerful as it is. But again, I had gone, I had, when YouTube came out, I thought it was all for cat videos and like fart jokes, you know, which it was for a few years. It was. <laughs> Tell us about just getting into BBDO and, and what, you know, if the things that we had talked about already, if they're going to apply here again. Yeah, no, definitely. But before I jump in, just two thoughts of what you mentioned before of how our stories are similar. So one was you mentioned that the how you started to realize where, you know, where you were headed in your career is because of a previous like um connection that you had to someone that you worked with. I just want to mm -hmm. add to that any person that you come into in your career, whether it be at an internship or college, you need to keep those relationships strong and mm. tight because that could lead to something in the future. Like for instance, it led to you because it was something that you worked on that you didn't expect anything to come to it. But I think that is so important because personally, every person that, you know, I've met in my professional and, you know, sometimes even personal career, you know, connecting with them on LinkedIn, having a conversation with them, it's, it's helped keep the relationship strong and it, it could help your career growth in the future. So that was one point. And then the second I just wanted to mention is um, you talked about, how you kind of did almost a similar thing, like a process of elimination of like, you started working on these, you know, small feature films. that was like two hours in length. And you, you thought that that was where your career was going to go, but you didn't realize that it was going to be much larger than that. And I think, you know, in your instance, you know, there started to be a boom in media what, by the time that you, you know, started really growing. Yeah. So that that's something a little you different. You have to be able that, to adapt, right? Yeah. So exactly. 
I, I do think that that is a little different for, you know, people that are growing up now, obviously like TikTok is a new, you know, there's going to be these new, um, you know, platforms that we'll have to learn and adjust to. Um, but definitely, you know, understanding that what we're doing right now could change in, in 10, yeah. you know, five years. So definitely being able to adapt is, is important but the target the target is what doesn't change right like the 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 ideal target you're because account management um the things you may be doing in it might shift mm -hmm. right but the idea that there's going to be somebody working with a client and helping you know to liaison these things that's probably going to be rock solid for a while there are other places where jobs have obviously completely disappeared but people know the sort of essentials of making a piece of content there's writing and sort of direction involved. Someone has to make it and actually produce the thing, right? Someone's got to edit the content or whatever. So those things might not shift, but um, the sort of venues in which they're happening do change mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. Right? Netflix wasn't around. Now they're saying, now everybody's doing that. Um, so there's a lot of, I, I, I strongly agree. You just have to, but, you, but it, it stems, it comes back to the same thing, which is, mm -hmm figure out what your bullseye is, you know, like figure out what is the ideal perfect scenario for you. Like it's very different to say, I want to be St like Steven Spielberg versus, you know, I want to be a showrunner like uh, breaking bad or something. And I don't think it's wrong to just shoot that high. Um, because if you think about it, if by coming out of school, you're already in what probably like the top, if you came from a good school and you work hard and you do all those things, you're already pretty good by comparison to everybody trying to do it. Okay. Like think about how many people want to do what we do. So a ton. So you're already pretty good because you've had years of experience and you've been trying hard. Um, it's just, there's like that gap from that, like five to zero, zero, one percent. But if you don't think you're capable or if you don't learn that you're capable of doing it, I think that's why that's like step one. You have to realize like, hey, if you want to do feature films and you don't think you're ever going to be as good as Steven Spielberg, it ain't going to happen. Because if you're going to start going and saying like picking all of those directors, you name any 10 working feature film directors, whether they're in the studio system or independent, it's arguable how much better one is than the other. Now you're talking in like, you know, tiny, tiny fractions of a percent. Um, and it's not a field like sports. Like, uh, I, this is an example I've been using re recently, Melissa. Like, do you know how much better Michael Phelps is than the second greatest swimmer in the world? No. It's like literally by a millisecond at most times. Wow. He is one millisecond faster than the second fastest guy. That's, that's, that's so crazy. if you're at that elite of a level, I understand that you're then training for like that tiny of like an improvement you know but when you're just getting started you don't you should just be i think hammering in the fundamentals right like mm -hmm. learning how to speak to, it's all about people by the way for those of you who don't know it's all about people you'll be fine if you understand people and if you're you know how to communicate with them yeah but totally right, agree. hammer the fundamentals in and you'll get yourself so much further than if you're focusing on the details right off the bat that's that's a big thing i think I think, yeah. And to add to that, it's focusing on yourself. It's yeah. Cause as you mentioned, if you want to be Steven Spielberg, great that you have that aspiration, but if you push yourself and like we talked about earlier, staying humble while staying hungry, like you, that hunger for like getting there and whether it may be like starting out small and realizing that you need to start small to build your way up. Like, yeah. Cause it's, it's process so important. driven, right? Not result driven. That's what we are here. We're huge at my company. We always talk about process, process, process. It's very much like, you know, M Michael Jordan's another example we bring up. Trust the process. I say it all the time, but I'd say the same thing. Michael Jordan might be a perfect example where it's like, that dude is the greatest in the world at one very specific thing, which is playing a game. And in order to become great at playing that game, he probably sucks at a lot of other things. But it doesn't matter. It does not matter because he was very clear about what his particular specific goal was, right? So he could sacrifice personal relationships, you know, um, 
time, um, friendships, fun, whatever, traveling. I don't know what people do on their leisure time, right? Things, that, whatever you want. I'm sure he just didn't do it and played more basketball and worked harder and was more efficient with his workouts than anybody else. And, and you know, and then of course there's like genetics and talent in that area. I think the benefit of our area is it's mostly skill-based. There obviously is a level of like genetics and talent and everything, but less so, you know, like no offense, Melissa, but you and I, we can't be LeBron James no matter how hard we tried, you know? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, would, I think I would that's a good say, benefit though, of, of what I, we do. I do think that, you know, this is something that we talk about at my job is if you have, you know, the skills, like the people skills and like wanting to group, having that drive, I think is really important because it's hard to teach that drive. You know, you can't, mm. you can't necessarily tell someone you can reinforce, you know, and kind of you can continue to share, you know, our stories of how we got to where we are and our core values. But I think deep down, you need to have those core values yourself in order to succeed. Because but for you can develop sake, those, right? You can develop. Let's them. say you don't have them now. You can develop them. I think you can. You can definitely develop it. But where I'm leading to is to be a good, for example, account manager. You know, as long as you have the skills where, you know, you're a people person, you're, you're positive and, and you're continuing to, you know, want to improve. But if you're the type of person where, you know, you don't like what you're doing every single day and, you know, you don't like the brand that you're working on and you're not trying to improve, even though, you know, it's been shared a few times as l you can teach someone, you know, production and things like that, but you can't necessarily teach someone that drive unless, you mm -hmm. know, you develop those skills later on. But I think that's, that's kind of where I wanted to touch upon is that's, we tell that to our team for, for argument's sake is continuing to learn and grow. I, crap, I forget where I was leaving there, but do you get what I'm well, saying? I, I come, listen, I, this is what I was taught. Hire for values, not skills. Yes. That's, okay, that's kind of where I'm sliding to. Yeah, and I think it's super important for anybody who's interested in our field that wants to get into. I mean, it's really interesting. This is for anybody who wants a job. Like, and if you, and I'm obviously on the owner side. I'm the one doing the hiring. And what I'm saying is, I will happily take a kid who I know is going to work their ass off, and going to go for it, and is happy to make mistakes and get better and not be afraid. Um, I am infatuated with potential. Because I can teach you the skills. You can learn exactly. the skills. You can learn how to use Excel. You can learn how to write a proper email. Um, but if you don't know how to learn, you know, if I say something to you and I have to repeat it a thousand times, like that doesn't work for me, right? Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I wanted to hit upon is if you're being told what to do and that person keeps making that same mistake, but you're, you know, in a managerial role, keep telling them, no, you should be doing this and they're still not wanting to grow, then it's, you, yeah. you can't really progress in your career if you don't necessarily have that inept drive. Right. Which I think is why when we keep saying, we keep driving it in, like know yourself. Okay. She knew exactly what she wanted to do and she was down and she knew she was going to be probably at, at, in college, you probably knew you were going to be, you wanted to be ideally at a big agency, I assume. Yeah. So, yeah. So she targeted that I did not know. And I continued to taste and eventually started to eliminate things. Okay. Um, and I went at home, but I stayed specific and I just edited or directed and I kept it specific and I made the best out of every opportunity I got big or small and I was memorable. Now I did not follow up and maintain like she had recommended those relationships. So oftentimes not much was developed but I know that's on me because I'm an introvert and I didn't know how to talk to people. And that is definitely changing because I realized how valuable it was. And if you're listening, no, it is arguably more valuable than actually being good at what you do. Okay. Because a, a lot of the audience doesn't know how the piece could have been better. Right. So 
and that and a lot of the people you're going to be working with don't know that either if you're just working with a small business who wants a little explainer video or whatever they don't know that it could have been better but that's not their job you're the expert and you need to constantly be like melissa said seeking for for growth and i i'm i'm working on a project now um that had this sort of exact thing like the client approved it which by the way never send clients things until you're happy with them but like we'll get into that in another episode but the client approved it i wasn't happy but i was too busy to like watch it you know i was like just get it out so then i had to i and and um my, my amazing and lovely editor was like well you know they approved it so we're like done right and i was like no 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 that's not how this works like we are doing we have to do right by them even if they don't see that like you and i both know this could be better right if we did these three things would it not be better yes it would be better it's our duty our duty is to do that we're going to deliver the best product for them because that's who we are and that's how you that's mentality is the only way that you grow hundred right? percent because you sometimes you get stuck in the everyday routine where it's like yeah. you know you need to complete this you know you need to send it you know you need to get it approved you start to really grow when you start to take a look and really review each and every single thing that you create with a lens that you want to make sure it looks good for your company and also for the client and if there's anything that you know could be changed even if it's after client approval it will they will be more impressed with you taking that next step yep than just accepting approval so i of I course because they want to know they want to know you care right exactly that's all we want to know it's the same thing in any relationship it's all about expressing and showing how you care and at my company we're very service and process focused you know we say we don't judge a video we're never here to say this video is good or bad and when clients ask us if we like it we always give them this like <laughs> rough response of it's not our job that it's the job of the audience to tell you if they like it but we can tell you without a doubt we've done everything in our power to you know translate your message on screen and i firmly believe that when they see it they're going to feel whatever things we decided they would feel x y and z that we normally align with before we do the project right yeah. that's what we say i have taken every tool possible in my toolbox to create a video that does the things that you need it to do and then from there you got to let it go and if the audience likes it or receives it well great and the best part about post-production guys is if it doesn't i blame it on creative so it's easy <laughs> i don't even know if i want to go there because then it goes back save it to for another one right? and then it goes back to account <laughs> and then it goes back to why wasn't that related so yes. i disagree but it's fine we'll dig in when we dig in we'll save it for another episode <laughs> save it for another um, episode do you want to touch on quickly just BBDO? Yeah, of course. Um, so after I had my internship at the advertising agency YNR, um, I think it was, you know, and I don't know if I want to touch upon this too. I, I know I said I was an overachiever. I didn't even mention this, but I was in an advertising club at St. John's University. So in addition to, you know, my resume and the internships that I had, I also had being a part of this club where I started out as, you know, just being a member and then I got more involved and I was, I believe like treasurer. And then I ended up working my way up to president by the time I was a senior. So having that on the side um, and then also St. John's university had the opportunity to participate in NSAC, which is a national student advertising competition. I know I'm an overachiever. I don't, <laughs> I, I, admit it i i get it um but in order for you, love you, it, you to understand it the works story, guys yeah <laughs> that's the point it works clearly in order for you to understand the full story of how i landed it you need to like understand the full background so just really quickly um we competed i ended up being a part of nsac um it was you know st john's team to participate and it was um you know we participated against other schools um so our brand was pizza hut and we had to solve a consumer problem. And it was basically like we were a part of our own advertising agency. And every person who was a part of the team had a role. We had to present, you know, how we solved the problem um, with a multimedia approach. It was a really, really cool opportunity that I was a part of. There were about, I believe, like 20 other people in the, in the class with us. And St. John's has participated in this for years, but we never really went far. So we really just did this for fun. 
um, we, when we presented, um, we ended up winning first place and ended up, <laughs> um, we ended up, you know, participating, you. To, we ended up participating to get into the finals. So that was kind of like a step one is you had to beat a couple of schools. Mm -hmm. There's schools all across the nation. So um, we ended up competing and to get into the finals. So we got into, um, you know, the pre final stage and we ended up getting selected to um, get, go to the finals. The finals happened to be in Las Vegas. So NSAC, National Student Advertising Competition, flew our entire team from New York to Las Vegas to compete in this competition. And being, you know, a senior in college, I'm just turning 21. <laughs> really, really cool. Um, outside <laughs> the fact getting getting to go to Vegas. Um, so it was definitely like an awesome experience. This happened right after I graduated. So in May of 2015. We participated in the finals in Las Vegas in June of 2015. We ended up winning third place overall. We beat out a ton of other schools. And it, it was something that, you know, St. John's has never, you know, gotten this far before. So we got a lot of recognition for it. Having that on my resume also helped, you know, kind of beef mm -hmm. up the fact of all the different things, being a president in advertising club being a part of this national student advertising competition at St. John's winning third place in the nation and, you know, having all these internships on my resume, it, it helped prep me for, for where I wanted to go. And I'll be honest, even having all that on my resume, I was still worried I wasn't going to get a job because I was, I was hungry and I, I wasn't sure if it was enough. So, you know, I continued to push myself. Um, I ended up, you know, when I graduated after this national student advertising competition in June, I submitted my resume to all these different companies. I ended up hearing back from one of them, but it was specifically for media planning and buying. And I yeah. knew deep down, it wasn't what I wanted to do. But when you're, you know, you get out of college, you need a job, you need to pay off your loans. And I'm sure everyone is dealing with that. So I went for the interview. And surprisingly, I ended up landing the job and it was for media planning and buying. And I was actually supposed to start, you know, um, I was supposed to start in September. So I had off from July, August, and I was supposed to start in September. Um, during that time and before, you know, landing this job, I also applied for a ton of other, you know, agencies. Wasn't expecting to hear back. I dug into the, you know, my Instagram, I mean, um, my LinkedIn, excuse me. And I was looking for any connections to try to be like, here's my resume. Like, I don't know if there's any job openings. I went on, you know, for example, I went on BBDO's website at the time. I found an email address at the bottom. It was for new business inquiries. And I just emailed the person. I was like, Hey, my name is Melissa. I just graduated. Not sure if this is the right email address for this, but I'm really looking, you know, for a job and, happy to chat if you have any questions. And I attached my resume, didn't expect to hear back. I did this for like multiple companies just out of the woodwork to try to see what I can get. Did you do any other big agencies? Um, I, I'll be honest, I feel like I blanked it out because it was five years ago, <laughs> but I'm sure I did. I'm sure you, I, come on, the Ogilvy's McCann's, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, I would say probably all of them. Um. But there was something about BBDO that I thought was really interesting, just of the accounts that they had at the time. And as they were, you know, definitely one of the top ones, you know, on my list. And I knew that if I started there, it would really help my career. So I was hopeful, but I didn't expect anything. So this was at the time where I was planning to accept my job for media planning and buying. I was supposed to start on Monday and I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to do this. Like, it'll be a stepping stone for me. Like I said, you know, just having it on my resume, showing that I got a job, but then eventually I'll move to where I want to go. Um, and then on the Saturday before I was supposed to start, I got a call from human resources at BBDO saying they were interested, that they wanted to move forward with me. I had a couple of interviews in between. And then I found out on the Sunday before I started on that Monday that I got a job offer from BBDO. And it was then, and I'll be honest, not everyone is going to come to this, you know, have the same scenario as me having two jobs yeah. lined up. And I don't expect it's that. It's a good problem to have. It, it is a good problem. 
Um, but at the same time, I, I also felt bad because, you know, after talking to this company and I didn't sign any paperwork, thankfully, but I was supposed to the next day when I started, um, I had to send an email, which happened to be at like 8 PM on Sunday before I was supposed to start the next day. And I just felt terrible that I had to, you know, I couldn't move forward with them because I knew that where I was meant to be was at BBDO. And the fact that I was able to get in and I had all these interviews and they wanted me, it, I was pumped. <laughs> so yeah. I, I ended up saying yes to BBDO. Um, but also wanted to note that when I went on these interviews with BBDO, at first I was supposed to work for one brand and, you know, I went on the in-person interview and the team liked me, but they ended up moving forward with somebody else. Huh. But they said they liked me so much that they wanted to recommend me to another team. And after that second interview with the other team, um, which happened to be the CVS team, who was a brand at BBDO at the time, um, they ended up really liking me. I, I had to interview with like four different people hmm. um, and they ended up selecting me. So even though, you know, and again, I don't know if this is common, you know, I went on this interview, you know, I had a great interview with the first team. I actually thought I got it. And then they ended up going in another direction. I was like, maybe this isn't right for me. Like maybe this is, you know, there's a reason why this is all happening. And then I heard back from HR being like, you know, you weren't the right fit for them, but we still really like you. And we want to see if it can work with another brand. And yeah. I ended up values working out over skills, me. huh? Again, I think that's, a, that's such a good lesson. One, obviously the fact that it, so there's a couple of big things that, that were obviously things become repetitive because they clearly work. Like once she asked, she went and she hunted and she tried, even though a lot of people will get that imposter syndrome. Right. Uh, and the other thing is you keep that underdog mentality. The expectations have to be low, right? That's what keeps you pushing. Not she's that she wasn't saying I'm not good enough. She was saying the competition is hard and that's the reality. Their statistics are against you. That is a fact something she accepted, but she then just pushed through and said, but I'm going to still ask anyway, what could I lose? And then obviously to have the guts to not, you know, to, to tell those people that in that manner that you're going to have to take another job, like you have to have the guts to do things. Again, her target was so clear. It was a certain type of agency and a certain type of job that it made the decision a lot easier, even though it was still very difficult to tell them no after you had gone that far because her target was so clear in what she wanted to do and the person that she wanted to become, she was able to overcome that fear to do it. And I'm sure looking back, you're probably happy with that decision. Yeah. No regrets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> wow. I mean, I think it's just, honestly, uh, I think we, we, let's start wrapping this up, but like this was super informative, even for me. And I'm going to dig in. Don't worry. I know we spoke a lot about uh, getting into a company and resumes and things. I, I We're going to do a whole separate episode on freelancing and what my journey was. And uh, I know I had mentioned it before, but just take note that I did not do what she did. And therefore, nothing happened for a long time. And obviously, I had the luxury of going home. You know, I had the luxury of parents that were very supportive. So if you don't have that, just do what she did. And I want to say one more thing that, that she's, she might not be comfortable saying herself, but clearly she's very, very good at what she does. If you guys haven't picked up on that by just listening to how hard she worked in college, um, and how much she's been able to accomplish in her short career, let's. She clearly is, is at the top of her game, and that is going to matter uh, a, a more than most things too. So, get good, um, be an awesome person, uh, and then you'll be fine. Work hard, right? Smart and long. <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the CNA podcast. If this brought you any value, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You know how much it means.